seat, guys. Make yourselves comfortable. Am I on? Yes, I'm assuming I am. There we go. The gin. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've ordered some gin and tonics because we know it's that time of the day. Be down a second, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a quick, quick show of hands. Is there anyone in the room that has never seen MasterChef before? I'm assuming I'm not going to see a hand go up. <laughs> Great. So I don't need to explain the concept overall. That's oh, awesome. <laughs> My dad, I'll get you later. Um, excellent, guys. So we are actually very fortunate to have um, Shalina here, Elena here, and Simon. All three of these people went through the grueling task of actually having to win MasterChef, Shalina and Simon in the UK, and Elena in Australia. And so what's interesting is what has their food journey been since winning? Um, I'm sure we'll get an opportunity to ask them some questions about what it's like to be on the show. But the most critical question that we're asking today is, a show like MasterChef, a global phenomenon the way it is, how does that translate now into the food scene in the rest of the world? Um, so maybe I'll just start and throw a general question out to the three of you, jump in whenever you're ready. Do you think that the phenomenon that is MasterChef has actually benefited the restaurant industry as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, one of the key topics that we were talking about in the morning was about developing trends and sort of seeing innovation in food. And I think doing a show like MasterChef, which has a global attraction, Definitely. people who do the show come from all different walks and backgrounds. So, you know, with me personally, I had absolutely zero culinary experience, but all the knowledge that I had was from the traditions of my ancestors, which are from Mauritius. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't for the show, the food of Mauritius would never have been exposed to the UK, but equally, I would never have had access to that industry, being a woman who had no uh, experience, who would probably get put as a pot wash, to be honest, <laughs> in the industry. So I think being able to call myself um, an owner of a restaurant and an exec chef is actually all down to the fact that MasterChef gave me that route in. Doesn't mean that you don't have to work for it just because it's a TV program. It's really, really hard. Um, equally, I think with the show, for people watching it, and actually for investors, you start to kind of, you know, find those key bits of innovation. So, you know, it may well be Malaysian food or Sri Lankan food or something very, very unique that gets the customers thinking a bit more about yeah, things. Very true. For those of you that didn't know, Shalina, before she won MasterChef, was a project manager in what field? Oh, in a quality and diversity. <laughs> quality and diversity project manager. So we've moved along that way. Simon, what are your thoughts? What do you think? I think what it does, it evokes passion from, from the, the diners and the people that are watching. Um, it gets them inspired. It makes them think about food. It, it makes them hungry. You sit and watch it at home and you think, oh, you're in the fridge or, you know, <laughs> then you're booking a table somewhere or you see when they go to the professional kitchen. And Please, then mate, you, help you yourself. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry, that's far more important. Yeah. There's one non that's, that's mine, yeah, yeah, thank you. So Continue, please. I, I thank think you. what it does is, when you watch the show, it gives you the, the inspiration to go out, to look at new restaurants. It showcases new restaurants as well because, you know, they, they go to the professional kitchen, they, they have mentors. Mine was Massimo Batora, I worked with Michael Keynes. You know, it, it inspires people to, to look at these, these restaurants and the places that they are and the places that they can go to. And I think it just grows the, the food brand, if you like. Yeah, I agree. So for those that didn't know, Simon was a data scientist. And now <laughs> you're running how many restaurants? Three. Three. So we'll come back to that in a second. Elena, fr the, the, one, the, the second Australian on the stage. <laughs> so from your experience in Australia, how do you think the food and, and, and restaurant industry has changed as a result of the success of MasterChef? I think it imp it's empowered audiences to know a little bit more about food, to feel a little bit more comfortable about food. Their expectations may have grown because they do have a bit more knowledge, but I think they want to go out and experience that. They, they do want to try some for themselves, but it connects them more to the chefs. It's not just about the, the contestants. There's so many different guest chefs on, so they are more inclined to want to go to those spaces. spaces. Um, and it, yeah, it, 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 it evokes passion for sure. And in terms of <laughs> people ordering or eating food or cooking food, I don't know how many you guys get, but I always get images of people, what they're doing whilst they're yeah. watching or what they've been inspired to go and do. Um, and a lot of people going into the industry. Yeah, I think, so for those that didn't know, Elena was a teacher, uh, high school teacher, I'm just correcting myself. 
So these three amazing people on the, on the stage this afternoon have, have basically, as a result of the, their success in MasterChef, have pursued a career in restaurants, food and beverage, which I think is phenomenal. Um, Simon, I'll come back to you quickly. No, actually, let me go to Shalina quickly. So once you won, what was the first thing in your head that you wanted to do? Oh my goodness, I think the first thing I needed to do was sleep. If anyone's watched the show, you spend three months, it's grueling with, you know, TV, cameramen, soundies, everything, watching your every single move. Um, so I had a moment of just pure reflection and trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do with my life. Um, I spent the first two years working in media, um, and I wrote my two cookbooks through Penguin, um, which was a massive opportunity. I really wanted to share my... Um, you know, cuisine with the world and have those recipes from my heritage, you know, written down and, and have people read them and write the, you know, do the recipes at home. But I sort of got lost in that world and then remembered, hold on, the reason why I did this is I wanted a restaurant. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feed people because I'm a big feeder. Um, everyone used to call me Big Mama Chef at uni. <laughs> and the only goal for me was to make sure that people were happy. And um, it's part of our, you know, tradition, I suppose. Yep. A lot of Mauritian women, are all about feeding people. Mm -hmm. So if you find a Mauritian woman, um, go and get some food at their house. <laughs> so the, the restaurant you've got is La Casa Maman, yes? Yeah, it means mum's house. Right. And yes. it's fast casual, and it's um, street food, but very kind of minimalistic, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. It's got the core traditions of Mauritian cuisine, mm -hmm. but stripped down so that it can be served very quickly by kitchen staff who are not Mauritian, which Excellent. is really important. Fantastic. Simon, the day you won, was it, I'm going to write a book, I want to open a restaurant, let me cook for... Yeah, my last words in the MasterChef kitchen when they said, what are you going to do now? Uh, and it, the show actually ends on this note, and I said, I'm going to get better, um, <laughs> good. which I've done. Um, yeah. I went straight away, I went on Stages, I went to Marcus Waring, I mm. uh, went to Theo Randall, went to Simon Rimmer, um, and one thing led to another, and I ended up being the chef for a football club. Mm -hmm. Um, writing their menus in return. They let me have a pop-up restaurant there. Nice. Um, so I could write my own menus and then cook my own food. Uh, from there, I met my business partner. Uh, we went on to open Wood Manchester, where we've got the Michelin recommendation, which, coming from my background, I think gives me more credibility in the industry than the industry would occasionally like to mm -hmm. give me. Yep, fair um, point. Being so raw and coming into it late in, late in the game, if you like. Uh, <laughs> And then we went on fair from strength to strength. You know, Manchester's still going well. Uh, I was approached by a hotel group um, working under the Indigo umbrella to open another restaurant in Chester. So we run the entire F&B operation for Hotel Indigo in Chester with Woodchester, the restaurant there. And then um, my next venture is uh, it's what we call an artisan eatery. Um, it's called Woodcraft. It's based in Cheltenham. And it's everyday food for everyday people with a farm to fork philosophy. And so that was, that was 2015 when you won. Yes, it's been and just five years just later. Five years, yeah. You've got three restaurants under your belt and obviously yeah. looking to do more in the future. Yeah, we're looking at another one, but I think first and foremost, Manchester's home. Manchester's my baby. That's where I want the accolades. Yep. That's where I work. We're open five days. I work five days in the kitchen there. So Fantastic. that's my passion. Which is also where Grace Dent did the review. She did, yeah. Oh, and yeah, it was actually really good, to so have a look on yeah. Telegram. Review, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure she's in the bar right now. Um, <laughs> Alina, so when you won that moment, uh, you know, was it the first, was the first thing, I want to write a cookbook or I want to open a restaurant? What, what was? I wanted more knowledge. More I knowledge. wanted more experience. I definitely wanted to have and run my own space. I wanted it to be all the things that I said in my food journey dream. Um, but I knew that I couldn't do that at that point. I needed to have more experience. I needed to be on the ground learning things from chefs, learning things about staff, learning... Um, really the basics behind the hospitality industry. And I wanted to combine my education, my passion for education, with hospitality. So how was I going to do that? I put myself in schools. Um, there was a, a lacking in vocational education in Australia at the time. A whole heap of TAFEs, I, I don't know what the equivalent would be over here, had closed. So there was a lot of skill-based opportunities being lost. That are gone, yeah. So I was trying to figure out how I could introduce those back into high schools for the students who were now forced to stay at a certain age, but completely disengaged with academia. Mm. So how else could I engage them? Um, what did you do? Food 
is a universal language, and I've used it as a tool for social change. So with one particular school, it's a behavioral school, so it's often the students who are on their last chance before juvenile detention or if they're transitioning out of juvenile detention or they have a whole host of diagnoses that, that affect their behavior. Um, first and foremost, I wanted to make sure that they were being fed mm. good food. If we're working with behavioral um, issues, we want to be able to change those at the, at the ground level. So I got them to cook all of their own breakfasts and lunches at the school, and then they would take it in turns. We eventually opened a cafe. They all trained as baristas, opened it to the public, and then they were starting to cater events for the Department of Education in New South Wales in Australia. Um, I would really like to have be able to package that and put it into other spaces, but I guess my position as hospitality and teaching, it, it's a bit of a unique thing, and so it was quite hard to then upscale that and get through all of the red tape get of buy -in. public education. Correct, of course, that's understandable. But I think fantastic to take what, you, what you'd learned and what you wanted to deliver to those, let's call them children, disadvantaged children within, Absolutely. within the space and give them something to, to, to work towards. So a lot of the conversations we've been having today have been around plant-based, mm -hmm. you know, and I think sustainability is something that the three of us, or the four of us have all touched on uh, recently. Shalina, The Sunshine Diet, where did the inspiration for the, your second book come from? Um, well, the actual name of it was much more a publisher decision because <laughs> do I look like a girl who diets? No. Um, but it was more about um, making sure that the influences of my world cuisine was kind of captured in a book. So it was all the kind of food that I like to eat at home, which naturally tended to be um, quite plant-based, um, very light meals, which were kind of low-carb, high-protein. Mm -hmm. um, so really, that's where the inspiration for the second book came from. Okay. The first book, um, Sunshine on a Plate, is all about Mauritian cuisine and showing the kind of heritage recipes that are really, really key to the Indian Ocean and the kind of tropical life that we eat on a plate in Mauritius. Fantastic. I mean, Simon, you wrote a book as well. I did, yeah. At Home with Simon Wood. I think, yeah, what it is... What was, the, what was the... The ethos around the book is it's to make fine dining dishes at home and chefs might look at it and say it's not, it's not high-end, it's not fine dining, it's very, very amateur, but it is for the home cook, yeah. um, first and foremost. I look back and think potentially I should have waited because the way I do it now is a lot more different. Having spent, you know, three years in the kitchen being a chef rather than coming out a master chef and just writing a book... Um, I think if I did it now, it would be very different. I, that, that's an honest assessment. Yeah, um, fair point. It's a good business card. I'd like to do another one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a perfect opportunity now that yeah. you've got all of that behind you. It, that first yeah. part is such a whirlwind yeah. in terms actually, of I, I have what an approach to, say yes to do to. The, the restaurant awesome. cookbook. Yeah. So, perfect. dishes from the restaurant, which yeah. something that we were talking about, about recently, Elena, you were saying to me today the number of opportunities that were thrown at you the Thank minute you yeah, won. Absolutely. And yet, 90% of them you. Yeah, I wanted to, I, I want longevity. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want to stick true to myself and not have to have trouble sleeping at night. Um, so I definitely said no to, as, as you said, probably over 90% of the things that were coming my way. I didn't even know why people were heading towards me. I'm like, we, we don't, we're not philosophically aligned at all. <laughs> I don't know how this is going to benefit either of us. Um, and, and it, is, it is a funny thing in terms of that instant fame and people wanting to, to utilise an image, um, and it, it doesn't necessarily matter what that image is. So I wanted to make sure that I, I was doing what I <laughs> really wanted to do, um, which I think has, yeah, held me in good It's work, working in the right... Yeah. But there, there is a restaurant in the future. I'd... Absolutely. Yeah, OK. Cool. Um, and I make... think all of the on-the-ground training... I mean, I've, I've trained enough youngst, youngsters, I think I heard earlier, very cute, um, that I, I could probably staff my own yep. space as well, which is great in terms of all of the other programs that I run as well. Fantastic. Did you find the same thing, Shalina? Opportunities thrust at you the minute that you yeah. won? Yeah, um, I think it's crazy. So basically on the first day I'd won, because actually when you win MasterChef, you don't get the trophy which is kind of like this big facade. It gets taken away the moment you win on TV. Um, you then have to basically go into isolation and not tell anyone, because you've, you've signed a contract that's about yeah. that big by I the BBC. three months. Yes, yeah, so you have three, three months. months where you don't 
actually remember that you've won the trophy and you feel like you've slightly lost the plot. Um, and then the first morning of you winning live on national TV, you get thrown into the BBC studios yep. for BBC News. On the News. red sofa, frightened to death. So you're straight on the red sofa, <laughs> you've got no media training, you have no bloody idea why you're there, but then you get the trophy given to you and you're like, yeah, okay, that's mine. Um, and then I got taken on a agent parade, so if you guys know what agents oh. are like, um, I met 12 agents in one day, which was mind-blowing. Um, but I then found someone who was really like me, down to earth, didn't really care about the money, really cared about my craft. Fantastic. And actually, um, he found some really good deals. The book deal was really incredible. And the TV work that I did, I'm really proud of. Um, there was some brand work that I did, which I'm not so proud of, but paid really bloody well <laughs> and helped me to finance my restaurant on my own so I don't have any investors. That's, that's So fair. in yeah. order to do that, I had to do a bit of, um, you know, a few dodgy deals for a bit of cash. <laughs> so I guess, I guess looking at that, you've funded your own restaurant. You found the perfect investors to yeah, partner 50 with Yeah, I'm a 50-50 investor, so yep. I did the same. I got some, some really good deals with a few well-known supermarkets in the UK. And and which, um, which we won't mention. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I invested 50 50 in my restaurant as well. So Fantastic. And then, of course, Alina, we just need to find the perfect investor. Yeah, for just you. need to find the perfect investor. That's fine. That's fine. Right right <laughs> One of the interesting things, guys, and I'm going to wrap it up because I know that we have pushed the time limits way below where we should be, is we've opened a MasterChef restaurant, uh, MasterChef, the TV experience in Dubai. And the three people sitting on the stage here all contributed to the menu in that restaurant. In fact, of the three of you, Simon, you've done your residency, yeah, there, your first residency. one, I'm going to say, yeah, it was good. which was last year. Elena is about to do her residency next week, uh, which basically means that they come in and they do a five-course set menu uh, for three or four days in the restaurant of their specific dishes. And Shalina, we have to come up with a time that we can I make your... I'm waiting to come, because come my Mauritian lobster curry is, is pretty decent. It is pretty good, I must admit, it's very good. I ate that while I was there, I've got to be honest, it's bang on. <laughs> it's bang on, isn't it, yeah. The food is... And when it comes really to good. curry, I know yeah. my stuff, yeah. Food is good. So what I'm going to do very quickly, guys, if there is any questions out in the audience... Oh, we have one down the front <laughs> here, yes. Jennifer, run. Thank you. Uh, my question is specifically for Simon, because uh, yeah. I live in Manchester, so I know yep. the restaurants. Um, obviously, Mana recently got the city's first Michelin star in 48 years, I think it was. Yeah. Oh, wow. From your perspective as a fellow restaurateur in the city, it felt, despite the sheer wealth of the, the restaurant offer, that for a long time the city was a little bit ignored as a, a foodie destination. Do you think something like Michelin recognition somehow elevates how people see the food culture of the city as a whole? I think so, yeah. I think there's one thing that I, I say it quite a lot and I'm having meetings with my managers or my, my, my chefs and things like that. And the, the local food critics in Manchester, right? Manchester's good enough for Michelin. It's not good enough for Manchester. That's the biggest problem. They don't shout about us enough is my first and foremost point. Um, Manor getting the star, for me, it's welcome. Um, personally, I thought Adam should have got one uh, at the French. Um, you know, he's been pushing for, for a very long time. I've eaten there. It's excellent. Um, but yeah, you know, the more the merrier. I think Manchester's a real... It's probably the toughest culinary nut to crack in the country, mm. if I'm honest. Mm. Um, I don't know why it took so long to get something out, out of Michelin. Um, there's obviously little bits that just don't match, whether it be the facade, the, the hotel that certain restaurants are, are situated in, or things like that. Um, but, you know, good luck to Simon at, at Manor. He's, you know, he's been the first one to do it, and I'm sure there'll be more to follow. Do you, perhaps? We'll see. <laughs> yeah. we'll see. We hope. Okay, everyone, please uh, thank them all very much. Simon, Shalina, and Elena for coming in this afternoon. It's been great. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. And um, we've been very excited about this panel. And also, the MasterChef restaurant in Dubai is amazing. I have eaten there many times, and it is fabulous Thank food you. and a great atmosphere.